the air commanders of Desert Storm talk about how they fought the war, focusing on the U.S. Air Force's role. Although the coalition struggled with the weather and the scuds, they had little difficulty with the Iraqi Air Force. They were no match for coalition pilots. The good thing is running southwest, by the one. Uh, the Iraqi Air Force was uh, basically uh, decimated at day three. Uh, it was decimated more uh, emotionally and psychologically than it was uh, in reality. Uh, because every time they took off, they got shot down. They could not uh, complete intercepts. They couldn't even get close to airplanes. Uh, and that had to be very demoralizing for them. Splash two. OPEC two, splash two. OPEC one is engaged. Second quarter, come off high. Since they couldn't survive in the air, the Iraqis began hiding their aircraft in shelters. There's two, boom, boom. Secondaries, big time. Four, three, two, one, impact. Boom, there's a hit. There's a shack. Uh, and a, oh, yeah. Keep it in there. Secondaries, big time secondaries. The Allies began to concentrate their attacks on these shelters by day seven of the air campaign. Laser-guided bombs penetrated and destroyed over 300 of them. Since they couldn't survive in the air or on the ground, Iraqi aircraft began to run toward Iran in mass by day nine. I think that the one thing that this war has done from an air power standpoint, without a doubt, that it has changed uh, mass to precision. Uh, where we dropped 30,000 bombs to uh, take out a target in World War II and 300 bombs in Vietnam, we dropped one in Iraq. Precision-guided munitions are conventional bombs fitted with laser or electro-optical guidance systems. Only 7% of the tonnage dropped on Iraq and Kuwait was precision tonnage. But some estimate that these bombs destroyed 80% of the strategic targets during the war. With the combination of stealth, and precision attack capability in the 117, we were able to attack targets very discreetly. We did not carpet bomb uh, downtown Baghdad. We took special care to make sure that we attacked only military targets and we attacked them quite precisely. Air crews were informed to bring home the uh, ordnance if they weren't sure they were locked to the right target. With precision munitions, the coalition could avoid civilian areas and hit leadership targets instead. We went after their Minister of Defense uh, facilities. Uh, we went after the security uh, facilities. We went after the Bath Party headquarters facilities. Those were the areas where the most barbaric acts and decisions uh, supporting those were made and executed and controlled from. It was uh, critical to be able to take that element out of that society. And it's also critical to let the populace see that that segment of their society was as vulnerable as anyone else. This was an electronic war like no other in history. The EF-111 was able to go in there very close and jam his acquisition radars and early warning radar. Anytime we sent a package somewhere, we had jammers, EA-6Bs or EF-111s, putting his eyes out at that particular spot. We had F4Gs sitting back. Anytime a radar did come up, could put a harm on it, suppress it. And because of that, fear of that, their ability to uh, put harms on them and kill them, they uh, were very reluctant to have their radars up for any length of time. Uh, and what that means is if, you don't, if your radar isn't up, is up for a very short period of time and you're being jammed, you can't break out a target. You can't work through that jamming. It takes time to work through a jamming. And because they were afraid of the harm, they wouldn't leave their radars long enough to work through that jamming. So consequently, they were not able to get good uh, PK SAM shots at us. They started ballistic firing missiles. And so that's just like shooting a rifle. Uh, it just goes wherever it's aimed when you fire it. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, the, that's why they've had almost zero effectiveness. Another danger for Allied pilots was anti-aircraft fire. If you've got as many gun sites as he got and AAA sites as he had up there to defend, you can't take them all out. Uh, it's, it's just a monumental task. 
So what you have to do is render them ineffective, and the way you do that is with tactics. And the, the basic tactic we use for that was um, we use medium and high altitude to overcome the AAA. The combination of us being able to suppress him and suppress his IADs and him not using his fighters effectively meant that from the very beginning we essentially had air superiority. And that accounts for the, uh, the very good, I would call good loss rates, good for our side. In other words, we didn't lose many airplanes when you look at the volume of this campaign. As, as you know, the, uh, at the 10-day point, we had lost about 20, 20 22 airplanes. And um, I think that speaks for itself. Phase three, bombing the Iraqi field army, did not come after phase one and two as originally planned. It happened at the same time. We had more than enough air power on the scene to do the phase one job at the beginning, and we simply diverted it to begin on phase three. So there was no time from, the, from day one on that the Iraqi ground forces were not under heavy air attack. The Allies used precision weapons to take down Iraqi bridges, cutting off the army in Kuwait from reinforcements and supplies. On day four or five, I put 11 F-117s and four F-111s, uh, dropping precision bombs and uh, we put seven bridges in the water the first night. Iraqi engineers built pontoon bridges to replace the destroyed ones. Allied planes returned and took them out as well. Other aircraft trolled for convoys. The resupply of the Iraqi army slowed from 20,000 tons a day to 2,000 tons. From the start of the war, B-52s hammered airfields and large strategic targets such as power plants, petroleum supplies, and military centers. But their most important mission hit the Republican Guard. Very early on into the campaign, we were providing three B-52s every hour and a half over a Republican Guard target or a target that had to do with softening up the Kuwaiti theater of operation. The B-52 struck regardless what kind of weather that there was over the target area. Secondly, we struck all day and all night without warning, without their ability to effectively mass a counter air offensive against the B-52s. And as such, it was very, very effective putting firepower on their equipment, their troop locations, their artillery, their tanks, and they could do nothing about it. And it was extremely demoralizing. Behind the bombs that fell and the planes that delivered them were E-3A sentry planes, more commonly known as AWACS. These controllers choreographed the strike packages as they delivered their bombs on the Iraqi IADs, NBC targets, bridges, and now the Iraqi army. The coalition averaged one bombing mission per minute against Iraq. The focus became destroying equipment as opposed to destroying troops. Our initial intelligence of the forces in field was poor. And we were sending aircraft out to destroy, uh, say, armor units. And when they'd arrive at the location where they were thought to be, they weren't there. And uh, the flight lead would have a difficult time getting a, a valid target for his flight. So one thing we did is we put uh, F-16s up over the battlefield. We called them killer scouts. And their job was to patrol a 20 by 20 mile box and find the targets in there. And then as we fed the attack sorties into that area, he was able to point out where the tanks were and we could make our attacks much more efficient. We also did that at night with F-111s using laser-guided bombs, for example. 